the last lecture of the course, um, women in early modern England, and I'm looking especially at their education and the social role that women had. Start off with women in the limelight. In the limelight just means, you know, in, in a star position, in a position where people notice them. Uh, we mostly see history in terms of the lives and actions of men because society has been patriarchal. Especially the early modern period was very patriarchal. Patriarchal means uh, controlled by men or ruled by men. And I've talked about women so far mainly in three, three kinds of contexts, three situations, and we talked about we talked about women as royalty. All right, yes, that's on your print. If you fill, fill that in on the print, women as royalty. And uh, a lot of them are connected with Henry VIII, so that the wives of Henry VIII, we particularly talked about Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn, the first two wives, but he had six wives. And uh, there's uh, Catherine, and there's, uh, there's Anne. We also talked about women in the context of uh, his daughters, so other royalty, Mary and Elizabeth, okay, who were Henry's daughters. Obviously, they are women in the limelight. And uh, there they are, Mary and Elizabeth. And uh, Mary Stuart, that's Mary, Queen of Scots, who was the, also related to Henry VIII because she was the granddaughter of his sister, so a distant relation. All right, uh, so-called Bloody Mary. Oh, sorry, sorry, Bloody Mary, the so-called Bloody Mary is Mary the First. Mary Stuart uh, is called Mary, Queen of Scots. I'm sorry. And finally, uh, Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day queen, poor girl, uh, had her head chopped off and she didn't even want his patients to be queen. So she, she had a, a particularly unpleasant time. Uh, we talk, so we talked about women in that context, in the context of royalty. And we also, uh, in the last class, talked about women in the context of religious martyrs. I particularly focused on uh, Anne Askew, in the time of Henry VIII. She, she and a certain others, Alice Driver would be another one, very famous for their um, bravery, okay, at a time when women were being burned, uh, well, people were being burned, but these women uh, accepted um, their horrible fate with great bravery. So they stuck out. They... they um, they would be famous. And finally, uh, other women who, again, uh, not in a positive way, uh, were uh, in the public eye and cause attention were witches, women who had been accused of being witches and who were publicly hanged, sometimes after having been tortured, all very unpleasant. So uh, we've talked about women in those kinds of contexts. And I, I also gave a, a, a brief mention of, of uh, one woman in literature. Her name was Mary Sidney Herbert. Uh, and her work was, at the time, compared with the work of Shakespeare. And here's one of her books, The Tragedy of Antony, uh, which is actually a translation. But she was uh, also the first woman to make a reputation as a writer, not just of religious works, but of secular works. There had been uh, women writing about religion uh, before her, but not women writing about just sort of dramas or adventure stories, epics, uh, which, as she did. Uh, nearly all the women writers who'd come before her, uh, we've got... Um, Julian of Norwich is one of them, Marjorie Kemp is another. Um, they were writing religious literature, and 
uh, they come a little bit before our time. They are um, before the Stuart, uh, sorry, before the Tudor period. But we'll take a little look at them anyway, just to get some idea. Uh, here they are, Marjorie Kemp and Julian of Norwich. And these were women who were writing in the late medieval period. But at that time, women only wrote about religion. Shukyoshkat. So uh, that was also true in the 16th century. A lot of women, even in the 16th century, uh, the ones who did write were mostly writing about the religion. Uh, so a little bit of detail about these. Julian of Norwich, is, um, she's the first woman to write a book in English. And her famous words, all shall be well. Which is uh, nice to know. And uh, Marjorie Kemp, who is the author of the first autobiography in English. So it's interesting that the um, first book telling a person's life story, a person writing about his or her own life, uh, the first person to write such a book was a woman. And it's a spiritual story because she had a spiritual life, but it's basically telling her own life story. So uh, that's an example of a woman uh, writing in English and also being the first inside her genre, Jangdu, uh, the first uh, autobiography. Um, I'm, I'm telling you this because it's important to think of, about the history of uh, <clears throat> how women got this kind of education so that they could write books and we said in earlier classes that convents and monasteries, shadowing, were uh, important for the education of people generally. And the convents where the, the, the nuns were, she said, uh, they were, of course, where women could mostly get an education until the Reformation, until Henry VIII, when he closed, closed them all down. So uh, Julian, for example, probably got her education from the Benedictine nuns, uh, in, through the convent system. And then after the Reformation, uh, secular, secular means not religious, okay? Schools that are not connected with the church. Secular schools began to take on the uh, role of educating, but those were nearly all for boys. So women actually got left out at that time. In our uh, early modern period, in the Tudor period, women had a harder time getting an education. In the Middle Ages, in the late Middle Ages, it was easier for women to get an education. Once the monasteries and the convents were closed, uh, the new schools were nearly all for boys. And so there was uh, a gap, and uh, women found it harder to get an education for a while. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that in a minute. Uh, just looking at Marjorie Kemp for a minute, she was a religious mystic. She, she wrote about spiritual religious things, but she was also uh, a family woman. And she had at least 14 children. And she was uh, a businesswoman. She had two, two businesses, two companies that she started, small ones. Uh, and she was a traveler, and she went to various parts of Europe. She went to Jerusalem. She traveled around. So she had a, an unusual and interesting life. So her autobiography is still a book that's worth reading because we get an interesting picture of late medieval life. And what's interesting about her also is probably she could not read or write. How did she write a book? Well, uh, probably she dictated it to a scribe. She, she spoke it to someone who wrote it down for her. Uh, we know also, or we think, that uh, people read books to her. She was quite a well-educated, I mean, she was quite, not well-educated, obviously she couldn't read the right, but she was quite a well, um, well off economically. She came from a fairly rich family, so they would be able to afford to pay someone to read to her. But it, it's, it's thought that she probably couldn't read or write herself, okay? So, yes, even a famous writer from that time, a woman, actually couldn't even read, quite possibly. 
Um, now, I'm going to look at uh, Stuart England now, uh, starting with um, Tudor and Stuart England and the work that women did. And obviously, most businesses, most kind of companies and economic stuff, it was done by men. But women would do, uh, very often it would be a kind of home-based business, something they could do from their own home. So uh, Marjorie Kemp, in her case, uh, one of them was a, a brewery. Okay, she was making beer. And the other one was a grain mill, grinding grain into flour. And those were both quite popular businesses for women in those, uh, in those days. Uh, I haven't put it in here, but another typical thing that women would be doing with, would be preparing material for making clothing. For example, wool, uh, it's a gino, okay, wool, uh, uh, it had to be made into a thread. So there was a, a process, and it could be done by hand by women. They would sit at home making wool into thread so they could make clothes. Uh, and there were other materials. So that was, that was actually, uh, most women did that, but it wasn't... Um, so you know what? It was just it was just It was just onna no onna no hito no shigoto. It was just uh, shigoto to yeba, no, like like housework. Part of their housework was to make make the, the the wool so they could make clothes and things like that. Okay, so uh, that connects with uh, a, a business which is textiles and dressmaking, and uh, that was another area that women were quite often active in. And uh, printing presses, okay? The printing press uh, was also an area where uh, there were some quite influential women. Uh, quite often they would inherit the press because their husband died uh, and they would carry on the family business. So we've got several examples of printing presses, dressmaking businesses, those kinds of things that women were doing during the uh, 16th, 17th centuries. But uh, all through this period, uh, working women were a minority. There weren't that many of them. And it was uh, unusual even to get an apprenticeship to a trade. Now, uh, a trade would be like a more specialized kind of um, kaisha, where you needed training. And uh, it was difficult for women to get that kind of training, to, to join a company. And that, the, the training is called an apprenticeship. Apprentice, apprentice means le a learner, a learner, somebody learning the work, learning the job. Uh, and you needed a special um, chance for a company to say, yes, we will train you. So, for example, in 1681, okay, towards the end of the period, we, we find that um, a, a woman called Mary Harrison, she was one of only six women who was uh, apprenticed as a draper. Okay, it, to be a draper, she needed to know how to cut the, the material to make the, the, the dresses. She needed to understand the whole process of making clothes. Uh, she needed training before she could do the job. So uh, 102 apprentices entered uh, the draper, drapery trade in uh, 18, 1681. Only six of them were women. That gives you a good example of mostly men. And if we look at her papers, this is, this, this, these are her papers, okay? It was a little bit difficult to see, but she was joining a, a woman's company. It was a woman who ran the company, Eliza Chapman. And uh, she was joining this company and uh, these papers were needed. And we can see that it was made for men. They just supposed that it was going to be a man. So it says here, said master. And they had to change it by hand. Okay, and other things. Uh, she, he, it says he. Okay, they changed it by hand to she because they supposed that it would be a man. So it was so unusual that the form actually would be written for a man. Okay, master has been changed to mistress. It should be mistress, but it's been changed to show it's female. Um, instead of himself, it's been changed to herself. 
Okay, these changes have all been made by hand because the normal piece of paper assumed that it would be a woman. Sorry, I pushed the button a little bit too early, then we moved on to the next frame. Okay, so that's work. Uh, and education, uh, well, in Tudor England, you did have this thing called humanist philosophy. Humanism was kind of, in some ways, it's the beginning of our modern thinking about we are all equal and people have equal rights and the world is a place where we should treat each other fairly. And so the humanist philosophy, which came up in the 16th century, uh, had um, people inside it who uh, promoted women's education. So we've got Thomas More, Juan Luis Vives, Roger Ascham. I think I mentioned Tom, Juan Luis Vives before because um, he educated um, Mary, uh, okay, the, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, Mary uh, Tudor was uh, his student in the uh, 16th century. And uh, these people did stand up for women's education, but, but basically, it's only for the elite. It's not for ordinary people, okay? So, um, women uh, and the poor, uh, well, there was a man called Richard Mulcaster. He believed that everybody should have an education, and he had some influence, but not enough. He, he couldn't really change things. He couldn't, he couldn't make it so that women got uh, a full education, or, or that poor people got, got a, a, a proper education. Uh, he believed they should, um, and he's, but he's a little bit unusual for his time. Mostly, uh, it was going to be men who got an education, and uh, a few rich women, uh, and, and poor people, men and women, basically got very little education or no education at all. So, uh, yeah, most women got little or no education. Okay, uh, moving on then. As the 16th century continued, you got more and more of this kind of Puritan thing. We saw, of course, Oliver Cromwell, and we could see that the Puritan thinking was not very cheerful or happy, and it was pretty strict towards women. So it wasn't a good thing for women uh, during the later 16th century. As Puritanism got stronger, things got more difficult for women. And by the start of the 17th century, uh, women were basically told, well, your job is to help your husbands. Okay, your job is to look after your children. That's all you should do. So a woman was very much second to her husband, second to the man. And uh, the new king, James I, was particularly against women's education. He, he, he did not think that women should have any education. Um, so what do, you, what, do you, what do you women here think about James I? Let's have a look at him, see what you think. Uh, he, um, he was, uh, his, his daughter wanted to get a classical education and uh, the proposal was made, and here's what, he, here's what he had to say. To make women learned and foxes tame has the same effect. To make them more zuri, more cunning. Is that what you think? Is your education just here to make you more zuri, more cunning? Is that what it's all about? Okay, that's what James I thinks. What do you think of James I? Boo -boo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically, okay. Uh, if you're a woman, you're not going to like that, are you? All right. So, um, but that was the kind of popular feeling, and the king was expressing the same idea. Women don't need education. It's just going to make them zuduy. Okay, it's better if they're just kept ignorant. So, most women got very little education. Uh, they, might, they might, if they were lucky, be able to read, uh, but uh, quite a lot of, especially the lower classes, uh, men and women couldn't read, 
uh, they would get training in how to be a housewife. That was about it. But what's interesting is that even so, you're getting, uh, we're beginning to see private boarding schools for girls. But we said, I said that most of the schools were for boys in the, you know, after the Reformation, but you start in the 17th century, you start to see that there are some for uh, girls as well. And uh, a whole area of London called, ha well, Hackney, in, in those days it wasn't part of London, now it's part of London, but in those days it was a separate little uh, community, and it was a, a centre for the education of girls. Um, of course, they would have to be rich. Uh, they were going to boarding school, they would sleep in the school, okay? Poor children couldn't, couldn't do this. So... Uh, these kinds of schools were starting to exist. So we know that, for example, uh, the, the poet uh, Catherine Phillips, uh, she went to a Presbyterian school. That's a kind of a Protestant, Dono Shukyo no Shurui, uh, Presbyterian. Uh, and uh, the, the owner of the school was Mrs. Salmon. And when she was eight years old, we know that Catherine Phillips went to that school. So there were schools in the, in the early 17th century. There were schools that were starting to be there for, for women. There was another school run by a, a lady called Mrs. Perich. It had over 100 students. And there were smaller schools in Hackney, and there were a few in other parts of the country. So these kinds of schools for rich girls were starting to spring up in the earlier part of the 17th century. Um, but the problem with these schools is that mostly uh, they were just a kind of training ground for uh, rich girls to find rich husbands. Okay, so they would learn etiquette. They would learn uh, how to play the piano. Well, they didn't have the piano, but the harpsichord, which is a kind of, or the virginals, which was a precursor to the piano. Uh, they would, they would learn how to play a little bit of music. They would learn how to dress nicely. They'd learn polite society manners. They didn't get an academic education. All right, so they were learning uh, those kinds of um, things that would help them to get a, a, a good husband. And uh, these schools were teaching. French was taught because French was a kind of prestige language, okay? In English, uh, always French is kind of jaw heap. You know, if you go to a restaurant, it's a restaurant. If you go to, a, if you look at the, the menu, it's a menu. Okay, these are all French words, okay? I think we talked a little bit before about how high class equals French in, in English history. So they would learn French, uh, they would learn dancing and music, and needlework was something that, that, that uh, women would do at the, in those days. They used to make pictures out of sewing. All right, um, I think I showed you one from Elizabeth I. Uh, the cover, she used it as the cover of a book. Um, so some of them had a, a little bit more emphasis on religion, but a lot of them were just teaching girls how to be polite and a well-educated uh, <laughs> um, But there were other types of schools that were starting to develop. Uh, charity schools. Uh, one of the oldest schools in, 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 well, the oldest school in England is called uh, Red's Maid School in Bristol. It's still there, 300 years later. It's still there. Uh, it's changed now. It's not a charity school, but it was set up originally for poor girls. All right, what would happen would be there'd be a rich businessman, and he'd say, oh, I'm dying, and maybe I'm going to... I don't know if, if it will help, to help me to go to heaven if I do something nice and charitable, but maybe it's a good idea. So he gave some money, uh, and he set up a school for poor children. For, Poor children. Very often it would be poor boys, but sometimes uh, somebody would say, uh, we'll set one up for, for girls. But there was no national program, so it just depends. You know, in Bristol there was such a school. In some other places there would be similar schools. But um, so, yeah, John Winston, uh, he, he, uh, he set up a school for 44 children, and that school is still there. Okay, but it's not a charity school now. So uh, there was that kind of possibility for some children to go to uh, a school like that. And uh, there was another type, 
Sanban no Shurui, Gakko no Shurui. It was called a Dame School. And it would be a small private day school for younger children. Usually uh, it would be a woman who was not married, okay, Kekkonshtenai. Uh, old, usually older, maybe well, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 years old or something like that. And she would open the school usually to both boys and girls, uh, and it would just be in the daytime. So, uh, they, or in the evening, they could come for two or three hours a day or something like that. But there was no national policy for any of these things. It would just be in one village they have such a school, they have such a lady, in another village there's nobody doing it. Okay, the children, the parents would pay a few pennies every week, okay, um, for, for the school. Uh, in one village they might have such a school, in another village there wasn't one. There was no national program of education. Until the 19th century there was no national program of education. Um, and the young uh, no shurui, kyoiku no onna no hiko no kyoiku no shurui, very rich, the very rich, the, the top elite, uh, they would usually get private tuition at home, or uh, sometimes they would go abroad, kaikaku, kai, kai kokue, uh, benkyo shi ni iku kano mo harimashita. Uh, but to be honest, uh, whether they were rich or poor, most women were taught that too much education was not good for them. Okay? Don't get too much education. Uh, you won't be a good wife. You won't be a good mother. Uh, so don't, don't get too much education. And then in the middle of the 17th century, well, uh, you, get, you get women... Uh, like these two Hannah Woolley Basu are making, uh, they start to set up their own schools saying, It's just etiquette and playing, the, playing music or dancing. We want to make a, a real school for you know, women to really start to learn. So this is happening in the middle of the 17th century. And uh, for example, uh, Hannah Woolley, she was uh, highly trained in medicine through her family. Her family were all medical doctors, and uh, she set up a school in 1655 with her husband. Uh, Making uh, could speak many languages, and she was a teacher to the daughter of the king, Charles I. So she set up her own school uh, around um, 1673, a little bit later on. And uh, just as an example of what she taught, she taught grammar, she taught rhetoric, logic, languages, mathematics, geography, history, music, painting, and poetry. Much more like the education that a boy would get. Okay? Uh, mathematics and uh, geography and history. Not just, um, you know, playing uh, musical instrument and dancing and a little bit of French. So... Uh, she wants to give girls a, pr a proper education. So, slowly but surely, uh, you're getting more schools that are giving girls an education that's not just to find a, a, a good husband. It's, it's developing. But this time, the middle of the 17th century, well, if you remember on the course, the middle of the 17th century, yeah, that's right. Um, you can't expect too much. Women, women couldn't go. They couldn't go to university. They couldn't um, enter the, the the professions. You could. A woman could never. I mean, however good she was at medicine, uh, uh, for example, uh, Hannah Woolley could never be a doctor because she was a woman. Right, uh, doctors, j lawyers, um, you know, high class professionals. Uh, no, women were not allowed, and of course, huh? yeah, <laughs> this is where it should be. That, that was all a mistake. I, don't, I think I think I had the same slide in twice. So, okay, um, the this mid 17th century was, of course, 
you know, the, the, the Civil War, the Puritan Revolution. There's, there's people who are out there fighting and killing each other. Uh, it's not an easy time for women. Uh, and of course, the Puritans get control. And the Puritans are not a good thing for women. Uh, so you, there's something really interesting that happens here. Women actually start acting politically. In 1642, great multitudes of women, taksan taksan no onnamakito, uh, marched on Parliament. They went and they said to the Seiji Kai, you know, we disagree with what you're doing. Stop fighting the king. Okay? Uh, they, they wanted a uh, stable society. And they said, uh, you know, shindemo ii. We don't care if we die here. Okay? Because the way we are living is so bad that if we die, sonani kawaranai. So we, we, we don't mind if we die. Uh, kill us if you want to. But we are going to tell you that we disagree with what you're doing. So they went and criticized the Puritan government and said, stop fighting the king. Bring back stability to our country. Uh, this was the first time, I think, you know, that women acted in this political way. Uh, what they wanted were, uh, was, uh, you know, trade stability for um, the markets. They were worried that with the fighting going on, um, people would not be able to uh, buy and sell. And uh, so uh, it was mainly the wives and widows of traders, merchants, who, who were doing this. They were protesting because they, they couldn't earn a living. They were finding that the markets were unstable and uh, they couldn't sell their goods. They, 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 couldn't, uh, they couldn't carry on trading as normal. So they were worried about that. And, uh, oh, sorry, that's not very easy to see, is it? Uh, the following year, uh, 5,000 women uh, again marched on Parliament saying, please stop this fighting, please stop this war. So uh, it, it was quite a big thing. We're talking about, sorry, uh, the following year, over 5,000 women marched on Parliament demanding an end to the civil war. Okay? They, uh, they wanted to, the, the fighting to stop. So this is a unique, really, a unique situation. And, you know, maybe we, we can learn, we can learn from history. Maybe. It was, it was new, it was surprising for women to, to protest like that. And... Okay, they couldn't, they couldn't get what they wanted. The, the, the fighting carried on. The Puritans won. But what they did was special. They stood up to the government. They stood up to the Puritans, and they were taking a huge personal risk. Think about it. The witch hunts were going on at this time. Women who, who cause trouble could be punished in all kinds of nasty ways. And uh, we've got Protestant sects that are also revolutionizing gender roles. Uh, for example, the Quakers. They say that the Quakers were the first people to allow women to speak inside the church. So we've got another voice for women. Uh, Women making public protests, women speaking up in the church, because in the Bible it says that your women keep silence in the churches, but the Quakers said, sorry, what do you mean? It means uh, women just means flesh. Spirit should speak. The spirit, the spirit should speak, whether it's men or women. That's what the Bible really wants to say. And so you get women standing up like this in... Uh, these uh, Quaker sects and uh, speaking uh, in uh, it was a kind of sect Protestant sect and uh, they're speaking up publicly and uh, one person who, who went to listen and, and criticize them uh, was told by a Quaker woman basically domare so this is a woman 
Quaker woman, uh, Protestant on our sector, should we not, a Quaker, uh, saying, you are the woman. Thou art means you are. You are the woman, for you are flesh, that is, weak. And therefore, you are to keep silence. And I may speak, because I have the Spirit, but you have not the Spirit, and therefore, hold thy babbling, shut up. This is a woman telling a man in 17th century England to shut up. Ooh. Heavy. It's not easy to do what she's doing. This was really shocking to mainstream society at the time. Quaker women were whipped, they were imprisoned, they were told that they should be sweeping the house and washing the dishes. That's what they were told. And they were not just spoken to, but as I said, they were put in prison, they were whipped. In one case, several Quaker women were tied to the back of a cart and whipped through this, from one town to another for miles and miles and miles. And then a popular punishment for such women was to put on something called a skull's bride, which had a, a, a bit that would go painfully into the mouth and stop them from talking. And they'd be put on this on their head, so it was like some kind of cage for them. And they'd be walked through the streets. And I suppose every so often he might hit the woman with his stick. Uh, it was very nasty. Okay? Women were taking a big risk by speaking out in the... In the Quaker um, church services or in the political um, protests. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you've got this uh, skull's bride. So, sorry, skull's bridal. Uh, skull means shikareru hito. Uh, so she, she is, uh, you know, the, you men, this, 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 so they, they punish her like this, okay, as a bridle, like, like you put on a horse, okay. Um, okay, so after all of that, let's look at the late 17th century, things changed a lot at this time, uh, the atmosphere changed, you remember uh, how uh, the restoration uh, I, I played that silly music by the Spice Girls. Girls just want to have fun, you know. And girls could have fun a little bit more than they could uh, 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 before this. So the atmosphere changed and conditions for women did start to improve at this stage. Uh, Margaret Cavendish wrote a book on philosophy and uh, became the first woman to go to meetings at the Royal Society. Uh, where uh, famous philosophers and scientists were discussing things. That's a good example of a woman being able to succeed in a man's world in the 17th century. But she was criticized pretty heavily for it by some people. Uh, for most people, it was still very difficult. For most women, although the atmosphere got lighter uh, and the punishments stopped, more or less, the, the, the burning of witches and the skull's bridle and these things, uh, whipping women through the streets, it kind of started to die out. Um, still, most women were not able to get an education, a proper education. Um, so the problems were, were, were still a lot, a, lot of, um, a lot of hardship, I think, for a lot of women still at that time. Um, we talked about the uh, Red Maid School in Bristol. There's the Maynard School in Devon, another school that, that still exists today. Uh, and these schools are providing a more serious education for girls. I talked about that to our Mac Makin already um, and her school of 1673. Sorry, I've repeated myself there. Um, so uh, these things were continuing during the later part of the 17th century. But uh, most girls' schools were still doing what I said uh, at the beginning there. They're still just teaching girls how to find a good husband. So, you know, be sunhao and uh, be a good housewife. 
and be, be good at playing the musical instruments and dancing to entertain, but nothing really useful. And uh, Chelsea became the new centre rather than Hackney, so uh, the fashions were changing a little bit. And uh, one of the first feminists, really feminist uh, women, uh, was Mary Astle, and she uh, went to uh, Chelsea to live from Newcastle in the later part of the 17th century. So you're beginning to get a little feminist circle growing up. And there were lots of famous women from that period who uh, joined, joined together in the same circle as Mary Astle, and they wrote about uh, women's education, they wrote about the status of women. We usually think that, that feminism is a sort of 19th century, and we, we, people usually talk about Mary Wollstonecraft um, at the end of the 18th century. She's the beginning of feminism. But uh, if we look right back into the 17th century, we can find it going on as well. Uh, so we've got women like these, Mary Chudley, uh, Judith Drake, Elizabeth Elstob, Lady Mary Wortley, uh, Elizabeth Thomas. We've got, um, you know, this is, these, these are some of the famous women that were in that group, along with uh, Mary Astor. So uh, you're beginning to get a kind of, uh, uh, too much to say it's a feminist movement, but you're beginning to get women who are getting together, getting educated, and moving forward in society. Right? It's starting to happen. And, uh, for example, uh, Mary Astle says, uh, if all men are born free, why are all women born slaves? You're beginning to get that feminist uh, note of protest coming into uh, women's writing and into uh, the kind of social consciousness. Okay, so I'm going to finish off then. Uh, we don't actually have the word feminism in English until the uh, middle of the 19th century. And as I say, a lot of studies of feminism take Mary Wollstonecraft's work uh, at the end of the 18th century as being the beginnings of feminism. But actually, uh, if we look at it, we can see that uh, people like Mary Astle were saying some very similar things 100 years before that. And uh, one of the most important things, the idea that uh, the advancement of women has to come together with education. Women have to get a proper education. Otherwise, they're not going to be advanced. In, they, they can't advance in society. And um, not only that, but uh, this was happening at a time when it was dangerous. They could whip you. They could hang you. They could... Uh, you know, put this skull's bridle on you, and it was a time when it was great risk. But in spite of that great risk, women uh, bravely spoke out. Okay? And that's why I say history can be a lesson for us. Okay? We don't have such great risks now. Nobody's going to whip us through the streets if we say something that they don't like, are they? Why do we shut up? <laughs> Why do we just say it? If we feel it, you know, we can ch we can change things. They change things, okay? And it was a, it was dangerous for them to try. So that's what I say. That history has lessons if we if we choose to listen, okay? Um, we can uh, speak up. We can change things in this world, and there's less risk for us in this world. Uh, than there is for those women in those days. So that's my final point, really, and uh, I'm going to end the course there. Uh, we should not ignore the achievements of these uh, early women from the early modern period and uh, what they did uh, to, to make it possible for you people to be here today. Okay, because in those days, the universities were all for men. No women at all. Okay? And so 
uh, look at the situation today where most of the people in this room are women, it wouldn't have happened without these people. Okay? So there's something for you to think about. Thank you. Oh, Janai. Okay. Um, I think, sorry, this should have been cut out. Yeah, sorry, that should have been cut. Uh, but yes, just finally some further reading. Sorry, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't revise this very well, did I, before I uh, presented it today, so one or two bits needed to be cut out. But, but if you want to read a little bit more about this subject, there's some recommendations. Okay, thank you very much.